morning. I'm Carol Ofsted, child analyst from Ann Arbor, and I'm here uh, to talk with our distinguished visiting professor, Matthew Hello. <laughs> mm -hmm. We've already had a very good start on the discussion. We're talking about training issues and ch child analysis and how long it takes. And you were just telling me most of us are older by the time we're child analysts. Okay. Can you tell me? I, I think this is the first time in this particular set of archives that we've had a visiting professor that we've interviewed that's a woman and a child analyst. And there's a great many of us very curious about your career route and how it felt. And I am constantly seeing young women who want to know, is this a viable career? How do you do that? And uh, we'd love to have them take your thoughts about the career as well. You know, I, I'm curious actually about why I am quote, the first woman who's come here, because it seems to me we've had a history of many distinguished women analysts and women child analysts. And a and a Freud, and uh, a number of people in Boston and in the village. So I'm not really sure why I'm the first woman, but I'm delighted to be here. It's a short archive so far. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, well, I became an analyst uh, because my father was an analyst, I guess. And uh, let me start by talking a little bit about him, if I may. Um, my dad was an Iowa farm boy who went to New York, trained, uh, did his psychiatric training at New York University, and initially entered the William Allison Mark Institute there, um, felt that it was not enough, and then when he came to St. Louis to train the first black psychiatrist at an inner city uh, hospital, St. Hospital, Homer G. Phillips, he began to commute weekly to Chicago to do analytic training at the Institute there, and a number of years later, started with uh, four other analysts, the St. Louis Psychoanalytic Institute, and so I grew up in this very excited, uh, enthusiastically yeah, involved community. Uh, psychoanalysis was really their life. I mean, they were really dedicated themselves to it. And my mother was a psychologist, so I heard a lot about that. And actually, I remember uh, when I was in my young teens, my father was having a bitter argument with someone on the phone from Chicago. Things were very authoritarian and controlled at that time. I remember when he hung up the phone, I said, but Daddy, you've both been analyzed. Why are you fighting? You know, it was like, if you've been analyzed, you wouldn't fight. So, but at any rate, I grew up uh, in that atmosphere and um, knew I was going to be a doctor. I was very interested in being psychological. It was funny, my father was very keen on my doing more neurology, but actually that wasn't my interest. I spent a lot of time with English literature. I think I was much more of an intuitive person, but I now see that, that neuroscience is very much a part of our field. I think Ken Dell's recent article, I don't know if you've seen that in the American Journal. It's fascinating in terms of the underlying things to psychoanalysis as well. Anyway, went off to college to Wellesley. Uh, for a while, was considering doing some playwriting. I do write a lot still, uh, some poetry. And, uh, but then, I went to medical school, I guess it was inevitable, and uh, was one of very few women in my class at Harvard Medical School, but really didn't feel any different from anybody else. He's somewhat, I guess, an anatomy. And then um, met my husband. Actually, it turned out we met when I was finishing up at Wellesley, and we were classmates at Harvard Medical School. It turned out we'd gone to nursery school together. I know this is not psychoanalytic, but it's my background. We were both in St. Louis, my family's moved, and we were married in medical school. And that was during the Vietnam War. And rather than go off to Vietnam, Tom went to my husband, went to the NIH, to run a lab there. It was part of what they call the Yellow Berets. These were guys who clearly did not, both, we didn't believe in the fight and uh, didn't want to fight. So he and I joined Medical Committee for Human Rights. And a lot of, uh, we, we did the medical coverage in 69 and 71 with the protests in Washington. And that was a fascinating time. It was at the NIH and I was then doing, we had done a medical internship at Case Reserve, both of us. I had begun
done my psychiatric residency there. Then we came to Washington with with the government service. I went to Children's Hospital, the Hopkins Children's Center, to do child fellowship there. And during that time, we were very involved in the protest against the war. And um, I can remember busloads of kids coming in who traveled, you know, 12, 14 hours. All of them were ill. They all had diarrhea and throwing up. And the cure was to get them to call their parents who had been very angry at them about leaving home and many parents were more conservative and plus what their children were doing or these were protesters. These were protesters, right. And we got to call their parents and we said, you know, Johnny's here, he's really missing you, he's scared, please talk to him and say he's still alone. And it was amazing how it cured their physical symptoms. It was, you know, like one of those instantaneous kinds of cures. Um, okay, and then I, during my child fellowship, I got pregnant and I began classes. So I began analytic training when I had, was in my last year of residency and I was pregnant with my older child, my daughter. And it was, uh, it was wonderful. It was the most exciting intellectual experience of my life. And I, I still, um, I find analysis absolutely thrilling. I wake up in the morning and I'm delighted to go to work. I mean, that sounds so Pollyannish, but it's true. I really like to do this. Um, in the last year, I have given myself more leisure. I still do about maybe 45 hours, 46 hours of patient work a week, but I crowded it into four days. So I don't see patients on Fridays. I work four very long days. Um, and I, even though I think uh, five time a week analysis is, is uh, superior to four, I don't do it anymore because I think it's very important to, to have other things in my life. In addition to writing analytically, I still write poetry and about a year and a half ago I began playing the guitar. My, <laughs> my daughter said that she said to me at one Christmas, Mom, you were a 60s hippie but you never played the guitar. <laughs> So you took I took a photo, I took up the guitar, and I have an absolutely beautiful young guitarist who's a teacher. And when he comes to my house for lessons once a week, I try to explain to him why I'm so nervous. He doesn't understand about transfers at all, but for, you know, he's only 30, but for me, he's like his authority in the whole new field that he's up. And he's not learning about transfers, but I am learning about the guitar. <laughs> so that's, that's how I got where I am. Um, when my kids were little, I mean, you asked about women uh, in the field. When my kids were little, uh, I worked more than I wished I did, but I do remember uh, stopping work and picking Amy up from nursery school, driving her home, spending a couple of hours with her in the day. I worked in the evening sometimes, keeping cold cases. Um, and one thing that was terribly important was that I had full-time help. And I still, actually, Carol, I, I still don't like the idea of daycare for any children. I really think the one-on-one -on -one is terribly important. There's been a lot written about that, and I, I do think that the image of a consistent caretaker gets fused with the, the maternal image, so that it, it really doesn't interfere with the child's attachment. But I think that there are multiple changing caretakers and multiple children demanding a caretaker's time. That's not healthy in terms of the early attachment. I'm glad you could say that. Greek has been our experience. Yeah. It's a very hard thing to come. I, I think that the recent integration of John Bowlby and Mary Main's work on the attachment theory and psychoanalytic thinking is terribly important. I think that that basis of a secure attachment in the first year and a half really is fundamental in terms of the book developing personality. Yes, I see you've yeah. written about attachment theory right. and its use and meaning for personal original. treatment. I wouldn't have asked you this right away, but it's so connected. Um, there's a place for child analysts, I think, uh, in the public eye about what children really need. And this is a really tough question because we're trying to figure it out here. Should we be the ones that say something? 
about what children need and this has come up particularly recently, not just because of the Serbian refugee children, but very much because of the new shooting and the violence uh, in Colorado where everybody seems to have something to say about how these things happen, what children need. And I wondered, you're closer to political uh, expression in ways that might be helpful. What are your thoughts about it? What do you think one ought to do in our circumstances with our class? What might that Well, it's interesting. I've done a lot of thinking about that, actually. And I can remember when, oh, many years ago, when my daughter, who's now 27, was then before five, I was a room mother at her school. And I also volunteered to give talks to the, to the parents. And the parents would wanted to hear about everything. I mean, things you we might think were forbidden, like childhood sexual interests and stuff like that. But the moms who were working didn't want to hear about the need to be home to take care of their kids, at least part of every day. And um, I gradually recognized that you can't tell people who don't want to hear things what they don't want to hear. So even though it would be nice to think that if we got you know, in talk shows or whatever, child animals and talk about what we believe in. I don't think that's where we can be effective. I mean, maybe a little bit, but, but this crisis is, you know, it's going to fade just like any other crisis. And people wear golden handcuffs sometimes in terms of being changed to a job that makes them uh, feel powerful in terms of wealth or status, and they're reluctant to give it up for something that they don't quite understand. I think one way in which we, we can be effective is in public policy. I wish more analysts got involved in that kind of organizational level. And we are training in our institute a number of uh, young people, you know, 30s, 40s, um, who are political scientists who work for some of these organizations like the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, where the public policies of some of these developing countries and the monies that they get for their public policies are going to be very much incorporated in the principles. Uh, and I wish the same were true in government in the United States. It isn't yet. I don't think there are any analysts who are, Although I understand in Ann Arbor there was somebody in the school board, an analyst ran for the school board. Is that right? I believe so, but yeah. the, this hasn't surfaced yet as to which one of them did. <laughs> <laughs> The public policy. I, I mean, think so. The, it's true. The public doesn't want to hear what children need, and the policymakers surely don't. Uh, I am very impressed by a program that you have here uh, at Starfish. I don't know if you know that program, where there's, there's a woman who was analytically trained, but not an analyst, who's an administrator of this problem uh, program and addresses the problem of foster kids and kids who have been sexually abused. And I think that kind of investment is terribly important. Right, and everybody tries to be a consultant on different things. Right. Yeah, and I do that also. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's not, it used to be we didn't go talk to the media because we wanted to preserve confidentiality. We didn't want our patients to see us in the public eye. Uh, I don't think we all consider that quite as important as we once did, but I, I just don't think we're affected that much. You know, a very small group of analysts, and uh, those people who have been analyzed understand it so well. A little psychological. It's scary, though. I, I think uh, our culture is really changing. I understand that this tape is going to be heard um, 20 years from now as you tape every visiting professor and it will be interesting to see if the culture has changed if, if, uh, if there's more structure provided for young people if parents become once again more invested in what it has something to do with the evolution of family and absolutely both you and I can see but we said 20 years I know previously we have had many interests including trying to get a family raised through all this, and this is what I'm asked most about by people. Young women sing to me, is this a viable career? And uh, it certainly is. Oh, absolutely. One has to throw money at it uh, as far as having help. You can't fold socks and play with your kids. Yeah. But then you've evolved many other interests, and 
Tell me about being a writer. Okay. Um, let me say something first, though, going back to what you said about, about being uh, a mom, because it's, it's connected. Um, you can't do everything. And when a lot of, lot of the young women ask me, you know, how can you achieve some uh, success in your field and still be a mother and still be involved with some kids? And actually, this, this is a career in which one can do that because you, you do have control over your time. You can see patients when it's convenient for you. Uh, you can schedule hours after the children are in bed or early in the morning before. I can remember when I was younger, I would start at 6.15 in the morning and then, you know, work until the be there for breakfast. Be there for breakfast. You're absolutely right. And the kids would be off at school and I'd see them and then I'd see a couple of hours in the evening. And it, it was grueling. Um, but it was very much helped by having uh, someone help out at home, having full time help. And that was very important. And also, um, you can make a lot of money, and we had a lot of debts to pay off in terms of medical school mm -hmm. and, and things. I remember my analyst, my first uh, analyst, telling me, like many people, I have to do analysis, you know, take out a loan. I thought, Jesus Christ, why don't you reduce your fee? <laughs> I took out a loan to pay for it. But it was worth it. Uh, absolutely. Writing. That's interesting. I've always written. I mean, it's just something. I love words. Um, and even now, a year ago, I, I, we have a writer's center for Bethesda outside of Washington, D.C. I did, of course, some poetry because I was writing a lot of poetry in college and I wanted to resume that. Um, it's what I've chosen to do, that and teaching are the two things that I like doing the most, other than just being patient. Um, I don't like administrative work. I think, uh, I, I found that there's not, for me, much gratification in planning and organizing a program. And I think there is for people. I think for those oh, yes, I can get a great deal. And what I often found was that if you do something right, everybody is accepted it as a given. And if you do something wrong, you never stop hearing about it. So uh, it did not provide me pleasure. But I love writing. I love words. And, uh, one of my, actually a compliment that I really cherish was one of my candidate patients said to me a couple of years ago, when she just began analysis, but had read some of my papers and courses in graduate school, she was a psychologist, that I talked in the office just like I wrote. And I, that just pleased me enormously that it was coming through in my papers how I think and how I do the work. And your personal self yeah. involved in it. Absolutely. That's the piece of courage it must take to be able to just keep writing and not yeah. be self conscious. Yeah, I think that's true. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. I, I don't, if you've read my, any of the things I've written, I don't write heavily theoretical papers. No. I write about right. uh, clinical papers because that's really what I do. Yeah. Um, I know it's thrilling to read them because, just because we never see enough clinical material of each other's. So, uh, and we have such really limited experience as well. It's not the that we can see in my lifetime. It allows me to think that. It's hard. It's always, every new paper that I start is always hard. You know, it's a lot of procrastination, and, and turning on the computer and starting to write, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, I'm flipping to a computer game a little bit, and then going back. But once you get into it, it totally involves you. Um, your mind keeps on working on it all the time. Good, that's inspiring. We need the inspiration. Another interest I noticed, I've given you a big guy, of course. Okay. Um, besides my interest in what is this business of obsessive compulsive defenses. Mm -hmm. But the other one was the teaching of psychotherapy, and we've mounted a psychotherapy program here with some ambivalence, I think, mm -hmm. about what are we doing. How deluded can a program be and really help send people out in the world that know about the treatment of children? You thought the screw, obviously. Could you give us a little of your advice? Well, 
or two in the back. Well, I'll, I have ten to me that I remember. When I was a candidate, there was a man, Robert DuPont, who was head of the Drug Enforcement Agency, and he tried to be a candidate, he was not accepted. I, I don't think this is confidential. Um, and I couldn't understand why. I don't remember the reasons given, but I thought, you know, it doesn't really matter. If, if he's going to be in that kind of position, why not give him the analytic understanding exactly? And I think the same thing is true about psychotherapy programs. People who are going to treat children are going to treat children regardless of their training. And why not give them as much as they're willing to absorb? Mm -hmm. I don't see how in any way it can be an interference with their work. It can only be a benefit. Um, it's, and people who are truly interested in doing analysis will move on. We've had a number of people who have gone from the psychotherapy, who've done the whole psychotherapy for a training program which we've had at our institute for a number of years, and then have moved on to do analytic training. So uh, it seems to me that you also you also get people who, who don't know how important it is to them until they've experienced the learning. That's a wonderful you know, viewpoint and very helpful. What does one have to lose? Yeah. Which the more anybody who has to do with children. It's, it's, so. it's, it's, not, it's not hurtful knowledge, I don't think. Not I remember when I was in medical school, they had, and then in, as a resident, they, there's a psychiatric group, group called the Group for Advancing Psychiatry, and they had um, resident fellows, so I was, was asked to do that for two years, and I was, I was on a, uh, they were studying psychotherapy at that uh, particular group that I was part of, and what they found was, it was really fascinating, that was that the maintenance workers at the Boston Psychopathic Hospital, that the receptionists at the abortion clinics could initiate treatment as well as anybody else if they were engaged and you know empathic with people. The problem was they couldn't terminate the treatment. They didn't they didn't know how to move people through to an autonomous position. I suppose because they derived too much for the benefit themselves in the relationship. And so they would either, you know, abruptly uh, cut it off because there was too much pain in to themselves, or else they would continue it long past the time it was appropriate. And it seems to me that, in fact, when you think of, I'm sure this isn't the only reason, but when you think about inappropriate treatments, you know, the, the boundary violations that Glenn Gabbard uh, talked about, or some of the treatments that people feel that they were hurt or very disappointed, I think, I think it's probably not because they were invested in their therapist. I think mean, that probably happened all too quickly or just um, quite strongly. But it was because something happened along the way and, and in order for the person really to derive, take some benefit himself from the work. And I think that's what programs like that can help people with. People who are intuitive, who are in, I mean, that's not your psychotherapy, but who are intuitive, interested in other people, but it can help them structure that limit and really help people take something positive from it. I mean, that's my thinking. That's wonderful. I mean, it's very helpful to think yeah. about that and, and this whole issue of termination. Yeah. And that that's a, such an important part of analytic education and it's just not part of other kinds of analytic education. Yeah. I've never seen it written about. It's the capacity to let go. You know, to the therapist to let go as well. That's right. Patient. And understand the, yeah. you know, the defense of the dance. Yeah. Enough to move the patient out. It's very interesting. It's amazing how you, how you take things at different stages of your life. One of the things that I found uh, when I look back at some of my old papers that I didn't realize when I was writing them is that we're always writing about things that are very important to us, those little pieces of ourselves. And I think that's true actually when you do analysis. But you learn something about yourself each patient. It's certainly true in your interview distinguished. Are you thinking about certain issues? Yeah, this is wonderful. It's very helpful because I'm very familiar with I had uh, listened with great interest to the patient with the child association mm -hmm. because of a child with an obsessional oh, yeah. problem or its defenses mm -hmm. and uh, been struggling with HMOs and insurance agencies and uh, 
certifying bodies about these diagnoses with the man should run treatment. Right. And uh, I'm sitting there listening to this wonderful presentation of this little girl who's defending herself with these special defenses and thinking. In our hospital, she would get some drug for obsession with the But you know what's so interesting is uh, Judy Rappaport, who is the one who initially talked about all the drug treatments in the NIMA, she's trained as an analyst. And actually, it's a friend of mine, although she's gone more psychopharmacological, she really understands the value of it. And Henrietta Lovett, who's another researcher and has continued some of this work, has told me several times when we've talked about this, that these kids do not do well if they just get drugs alone. They really don't. They're, they're very disturbed, and they really need some more intensive form of psychotherapy. The drugs can be an ancillary treatment, but of course the insurance company is not. And you know what's fascinating is that the, the iron, well, let me go back a bit. When I was finishing my training and trying to make some money in the process of building up my practice, I worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield as an advisor along with Alan Zines, another child analyst, mm -hmm. trying to decide which claim should be honored and which not. And our big struggle then was whether or not to honor six time a week analysis or only pay for five days a week. Oh, <laughs> I but the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank, which has many um, employees from all over the world, pay for completely for analysis. Wow. So I think it's interesting that other people dealing with other countries, and I know that's true in Holland too, and in Canada even, analysis is fully subsidized. Right. But not here. Here we're for the quick and easy. Well, I'm sure the pendulum will go in the other I direction. Hope so. I hope so. Uh, does it, uh, it, do candidates worry about an analysis? Of course. Of course they do. Yes, of course they do. Very much so. It's such a wonderful perspective to hear about that other countries haven't come to this 20 sessions that this may not be forever. And in Detroit, it seems to me, the community outreach that we do really has built up an interest in psychoanalysis that many people are willing to pay for it. Right. Or at least as much as they can. Right. Yeah, we all do what you see. Uh, I think we're supposed to say the date today. Is that right? Oh, we didn't say the date today. Right. It's April 24th, 1999. And we're having a good time. This is fun, actually. Do you need us to stand? No. Okay. Uh, anything else that I can ask? What would you say if you knew 20 years later somebody would be looking at this and saying, I'm wondering what the child asked for bad distinction was thinking about? Thinking about seeing my family soon. I'm looking forward. I've been away for a week and I'm looking forward to seeing my patients. Uh, I really am. I want to. I want to get back to work. It's a funny thing. I love it. Um, what, what should I say? I would say that child analysis is much more difficult than adult analysis, I think, because not only uh, do you have to think about what's going on between you and the patient and continually self-scrutinize, but there are two other factors. One, there's the tug to be nurturing even more so than with an adult patient. And I think when you have to guard against it, because the transference is the same with children, and the kind of transference pressures are the same. And the other, the other issue is that you really have to learn how to speak to a child in a way that they can understand. And that, that's tremendously important. So it means sort of almost translating some of your thoughts into a level that the, that the child will integrate. Um, one of the nice things as you get older is, is the capacity to pick and choose. And I know I've just begun the analysis of two little girls who are eight uh, who have similar histories but very different symptoms. So I think of analysis not only as a, a treatment that provides something for the patient but also as a source of information to me. But I'm still growing, I'm still learning. Right. And it'll be interesting for me both to see how these little girls evolve in their treatment but also what my responses will be to the two. Differing responses. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because yeah, I'll have their similar histories in mind, but then for the moment-to-moment -moment response will be very different. Um, and very here and now. And so. very here and now. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Very here and now. Um, I guess the, the most important
important thing to me about child analysis is most of my practice is adult patients. I really, at one time I saw four kids under 10, but I don't do that anymore. I think it's exhausting to see children. So I have a couple of adolescents in my, in my, currently in two little girls. But I think child analytic training is enormously important in informing my work with adults. And um, if for no other reason than just to have a greater understanding of patients, adult patients, I really try to get as many candidates as possible to do some child analytic training, even if they don't complete the course, to have a one child in analysis. I mean, it really convinces you that everything Tori wrote about was true. I mean, all the phases of development. Yeah, you see it a little bit in your own children, but you're too involved. Yeah, but there has to be something a little bit. Right. Yeah. I'm glad you got a chance to say that, because I think it's terribly important. We agree, too. Uh, you're speaking at every level of development, so it's a, it's a different kind of, of uh, that internal collaboration. Absolutely. What level am I speaking at now for this child, but then also with the adult? What level am I speaking at? Yeah. It's just delightful. I'm so glad you would come and talk to us. And I know that the week of the school has been exhausting. Uh, it's really nice to come. Thank you. It certainly wasn't for the money. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, yeah. I, I really, my, as I was telling you earlier, my husband said it's my good deed for the century. But it does make me feel good. And it, I'm tremendously impressed by the program in Michigan. I have to tell you, yeah. by the different places that, and their investment in psychoanalysis. Revolving. Oh, but no, seriously, I think I think you have the, the largest outreach of any place in the United States that I've seen, certainly. Um, so it's quite impressive, and I think you're doing a good thing. We hope all to be on your policy committee, especially. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's good that we were invited to. Invited to.